you're with Property Mythbusters. Hi, I'm Ken from Avora Finance Broker. I'm Deb from Crave Property Advisory. And I'm John Gomovich from Real Property Manager. And so we're here to bust the myths around the contradiction, contradictions and misleading information in the property investing space. Um, and for the next 10 minutes, we'll be discussing uh, Labor's proposed policies uh, will help housing affordability. So some of the proposed changes are to negative gearing and capital gains tax. John, yeah, so this, this is a, this is a uh, hot topic and certainly has been a political football um, discussed uh, as we lead up to um, a federal election. And so the proposal, the proposal is to, uh, to curb uh, the, ne the current negative gearing regime um, and to uh, curb the capital gains tax paid by, by investors. Um, so the, the proposal from Labor um, is to, from their, from their angle, is to dampen the property market so that the um, first home buyer does a, does a comeback yeah. um, and that housing becomes affordable, more affordable mm. um, and is, no, is not longer out of reach mm. of, of the average Australian. Yeah. Um, so before we go into uh, the policy, um, Deborah, just to explain to our audience, what is negative gearing? So negative gearing, particularly relating to property, is when expenses exceed profits, creating a loss. And then the loss is offset against income, and that can be, in some cases, a tax benefit and can be packaged up as being attractive to some investors often wrongly, but let's not go there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so do you want to talk a little bit about what Labor's changes are? Yeah, so the, so the current, the current um, benefits uh, in relation to ne negative gearing is that it applies to all investment classes, mm. um, both new property and, and established. And even shares. And, and shares as mm. well, if you have a share portfolio. Mm. Uh, the proposal from Labor is to segregate that uh, and make it apply to new properties only. <laughs> and on the capital gains tax, it's to reduce the current 50% discount benefit down to 25%. Yeah. Um, and for those to, uh, to work uh, with, with new, new build properties only. Yeah, um, and so with those changes, from your perspective, yeah. What do you believe the rollout impact will be? Yeah, so when you have a when you have such a policy um, being discussed, and if if it goes through, <laughs> uh, will be the big question. Mm. Uh, you have two asset. You have a market where you have two asset classes. So you've got sure. the new builds, and you've got the established properties. The established properties will only be grandfathers to those who are already receiving the benefits. But moving forward from a timeline when the policy is enacted, or if the policy is enacted, um, that will only apply to one class of property. So if there's one class of property that's going to be favoured, I can see some issues arising out of that. Mm. Um, firstly, the obvious one to me is that um, there's a concentration of both uh, property investors and home buyers going for a particular class of property, which is new build. So you can yeah. only imagine, and you can just see. Um, that was the point I was going to cover. Oh, yeah, you, the interest that it's going to, <laughs> that's that's that it's going to drive. So you want yeah. you want to dwell a little bit more on that? Um, yeah. So from my perspective, um, you know, because we're advising people on what to buy, um, so we see that creating this new class will um, entice wrongly unsuspecting investors into um, wanting new property only because they think they're getting the tax benefits yeah. so that will drive prices up and that will push effectively first home buyers out because new property is attractive to first home buyers because they get the grants and and stamp duty concessions and all of that kind of thing so effectively, even though Labor says that they're introducing this change to actually 
help first home buyers, it'll have the exact opposite effect, as we were saying um, a few weeks ago, similar to the NRAS saga. Yeah, so, um, all, so all of a sudden we can see that there may be another surge. Yeah. Um, we, we know factually that, and there's data around this already, that construction and, and new starts for new builds has been in, in decline. Yeah. You can almost see the curve going back up again because yeah. there's this class of properties that now favours um, both investors and home buyers. All of a sudden they're competing for that stock yeah. and that stock only driving the price up. That's right. Because there's and demand. So we'll see all these yeah. developers going further and further, all the way up to Alice Springs. And and so we're like, what, well, are our cities going to like just, you know, creep out even further because nobody wants to buy existing stock anymore because yeah. it's... It, it doesn't tick all the boxes Well, for, yeah. for some. Mm. Because let's, let's face it, um, over the years, uh, it was a, it has been used as a tool for tax minimization that's right not tax avoidance but let's be clear on that yeah <laughs> but it has been a tool for tax minimization mm. that's been used by accountants and and financial planners as, as yeah. a vehicle that's there it's legal it's not illegal it's legal yeah um and uh it did it did and has favored um yeah the upper end high income earners yeah and so what do you see the impacts are from a, a finance perspective yeah, from a finance perspective, yeah. sure. So, uh, look, I mean, it's 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 yet to play itself out. Um, in the recent, you know, uh, months and, and and maybe year or so, there's been a lot of uncertainty in, in, in playing around in our space. So this is just another one uh, added to to the long string of events which are ongoing. But I think borrowing capacity probably is going to be one of the bigger ones that is affected because some lenders do take into consideration negative gearing, and if that's taken off the table um, that certainly does reduce borrowing capacity mm. um, so that could have a, an interesting income um, you know regardless of whether it's an investor or a home buyer um, and the other thing as well is probably to do with valuations so uh, if generally speaking uh, the lenders are, are a little reactive in terms of what happens and, and kind of keep their ear to the ground and what's happening in the property space but yeah certainly if there's a division between two different types of uh, properties one being new and the other one being old um, and they see that there's a significant risk in lending to new property uh, it can impact valuations um, mm. and, and even then uh, apart from impacting valuations um, there are certain credit policies such as the LIN, uh, LVR loan to value ratio which they can adjust specific to new to units or new buildings and, and that can yeah, affect um, home loans and the choice um, of property that people can, can purchase. So the, so the current big four banks, let's just say right now, are seeing uh, new build off the plan, especially off the plan property, especially apartments, mm -hmm. um, as, as, as a high risk or a high risk, uh, prop, uh, high, a riskier proposition. Um, so if, if an investment is a riskier proposition, then that will require um, more skin in the game. Yeah, so that's one way that they can do that by, you know, by increasing the requirements of yeah, the deposit or the funds that the buyer contributes. And yeah, that's affected through the LVR lenders uh, loan to value ratio. So they, they reduced that um, quite some time ago. One of the major banks reduced the LVRs for Chatswood, yeah. um, and mm. and that was an interesting mm. interesting move by them. But they could have been over like overcapitalized or have too much risk exposure concentration risk. Um, so yeah, definitely they can increase the the requirements specific, or or they can kind of create new policies. I mean that's not outside the question either. Sure. If they mm. feel like yeah, it'll and, it'll and, and so to an investor, um, the the key with properties the power of leverage. All of a sudden the leverage ratio has been skewed mm. um, where someone else's money is no longer really working for them that hard in, any longer because of the leveraging yep. um, situation yep. uh, and, and obviously for a first home buyer um, having to raise a more deposit 
uh, is even is even a challenge or become an even bigger challenge. Yeah, like for new home buyers. Yeah, generally speaking, um, when speaking to them, it's the deposit size, which is probably yeah. the biggest uh, thing. I mean, income does kind of increase um, as they progress in their careers and things like that. So, you know, that that kind of looks after itself. But the deposit size is generally the bigger item. For, for most first home buyers and yeah. if there's an increase in that yeah that, that'll definitely and, and do you think that we might see a change in the actual lending landscape so different players come into it yeah so uh, sometimes yeah sometimes the major like different tiers so the second tier lenders mutual banks and credit unions and things like that might enter that space I'm just thinking uh, it depends on how things play out because they are starting to get a bigger uh, share of the market uh, and ASIC and the regulators are starting to look to some of the non-ADI uh, lenders and tightening and getting visibility and, and APRA has been given um, specific powers to make changes um, for those players in that space. So that, I mean, they could go for it, definitely. Um, and then mm. from there we could see changes, but yeah, no, mm. definitely. Yeah. Some are small lenders. And, and it's possible that these two words we haven't heard for a long time um, vendor finance mm. could make its way well, back <laughs> to, uh, yeah, because yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the tier ones and possibly some of the tier twos um, will, will just look at it from a risk perspective and say, no, yep. you know, we, we, we can lend, but you're going to have to put, put, more in, mm. put more into the deal. Um, mm. and, and that's going to be a real challenge. Yeah. Yep. And so what about from a rental perspective, what do you believe will happen with rent? Well, that's interesting. Um, without it, I mean, this, this policy is being, is being discussed, but bear in mind that this policy was being discussed about two years ago when the market was completely different. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it kind of made sense back then, not fully, but it kind of did mm. as a way to curb um, the hot activity that's been going on for the last seven or eight years, uh, spe especially in our um, uh, in the markets, uh, without this policy being enacted, the market is simply correcting itself already. Yeah, and right. we're seeing a downward pressure on rents, and we're seeing a downward pressure on on, on property values, particularly in Sydney and in Melbourne. In Sydney and Melbourne, yeah, 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 the two the two biggest markets. Mm. Um, so the train of thought is, well, the market's already naturally correcting itself um, and there are certain things that have already occurred uh, last year and a half with, with, with lending policy, with the Bank Royal Commission, mm. um, with, I think, supply and demand. So it mm. comes back to, okay, well, this, well, this new class property that's going to be put on a pedestal um, be of great demand. Um, Will the property investors come back uh, mm -hmm. if if, uh, if if this makes sense? Mm -hmm. um, and and do they see a future in off the plan mm -hmm. new build new build property? So can I yeah can yeah. I just jump in there? Yeah. I don't think it'll be really experienced investors that'll get taken by this change. Yeah. Um, what I'm more concerned about is your first time investor who will just get caught up in that really hard selling hype yeah. from like the spruikers or the marketers and they'll just believe what they're told and so we'll have that destabilizing impact of putting more first time investors who are very sensitive to any changes it'll put all, more people into that kind of class and it'll mean mm. that that area is more unstable because the minute you know in um, interest rates increase, they'll like have to sell, and so that puts them more at risk. And then the poor first home buyers who might have bought there, you know, they've already paid too much yeah. because there's new investors going into that space, um, and so the whole thing will collapse. While the experienced investors will go, and the ones that these are the ones that. Bill says he's trying to target the ones with mm. hundreds of properties. Um, like they'll be standing there going, "I'll just scoop those up, thanks." Look, yeah, it just doesn't make yeah. sense to me. But anyway, you're making this um, that point about yeah. So it's back, it's, it's back to I guess it's back to the supply and demand. So it can mm. go it can go either way. 
mm. to go either way. Like rents, rents are starting to um, uh, reduce in Southern Capital City because of oversupply. Mm. So we're seeing um, first time in, in years reductions of 5, 10, 15% in some Sydney metro mm. areas. Um, same thing's happening with some um, uh, um, suburbs in the state of Melbourne yeah. as well. Um, so the question is, moving forward, will there be more demand for this type of stock? Um, will construction and building recommence and reignite, building more stock? And what sort of further pressure is that going to add mm. on both rents and property values if um, the market says, well, no, yeah. well, no, I'm not, I'm not investing in this class any, any longer. And um, as you were saying earlier, that because the um, first home buyers, because rents might have come down because there's more stock. Um, and what, what was that point about the first home buyers would start to buy their own properties anyway, so there's less renters? That, that's correct. So you can see, you can see a portion of the market that are currently renters, if they're given the chance to become home buyers, they'll Which take, want. They'll take it, yeah. so they'll stop being renters. Mm. Um, which potentially means that you can have more stock available for rent, and that's putting more downward pressure. More downward pressure. So you've got this issue of um, shortfalling. If there's more pressure on rent in the downward spiral, then there's going to be a shortfall in serviceability mm. um, to the property investor. Again, mm. um, doing the maths, you would think twice about um, going into such. Such a stock property, if mm. um, uh, you know, it's not it's not getting the yield. The yield is, yeah, um, you know, around on average around three three and a half percent. Yeah, so it's my pretty low. my view is that this proposed change will cause more financial hardship, and then someone else will have to come in, change the policy, and like fix it back up again. Yeah. That's probably. So where, where, yeah, where, 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 where I can see Bill coming uh, uh, from is, okay, so we'll do away with the tax incentive schemes for property to save us money mm. <laughs> and, 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 and bring it back to the coffers um, for the government to pay for services, yeah. schools, roads, health, and so forth. However, they're detracting... Um, what is ultimately the self-funded retiree build, and disincentivize yeah. building their own wealth and yeah. not relying on the government. That's right. Yeah, that was. So it's that it's almost government. counter counterproductive. Yeah. It's a counterproductive policy. Yeah. Well, anyway. So. Well, that's our that's our thoughts. Yeah. So, is there anything else anyone would like to add? Nope. Um, so, thanks very much for watching. We love your feedback. So please join the Property Myth Busters Facebook group to send us questions or myths you would like busted. You can also contact us directly through our social media channels. So thanks for watching. Bye. Take care.